Tonight, document drama. Are you confident you did nothing wrong, Mr. President? The Justice Department investigation into the president's handling of classified data found at his old office and home. Plus, countering a triple threat. The U.S. ramps up military cooperation with Japan in the face of growing tensions with China, Russia, and North Korea. And not just Pac-Man anymore. I'm currently actually looking at the darker sides of games. How radical extremists use video games to recruit teenage gamers. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. Backlash over the president's handling of classified documents. Welcome to Faith Nation. From our studio in Washington, D.C., I'm Matt Gelka. The fallout continues following the discovery of classified documents at President Biden's office and home from his time as the vice president. The revelation is proving to be politically explosive with an independent special counsel appointed, appointed by the attorney general now investigating. The White House insists the documents were just misplaced. Our CBN News senior Washington correspondent Tara Mergener has been tracking the story. Tara, what's the latest? Well, Matt, the White House says they were not given a heads up over the DOJ announcement Thursday of a special counsel. The investigation now digging into how and why those classified documents ended up at President Biden's former office and home. And just a day later, Biden's lawyer revealing one more as located in another room at the House. The White House is refusing to answer key questions about these documents. What I'll say from here is uh, any any questions that you we may have about the review, about the process, I would refer you to the Department of Justice. Uh, I would also refer you to my colleagues over at the White House Council. Uh, I'm not going to get into any specifics from here. Concerns are already being raised about the White House's transparency. President Biden ignored questions from reporters about the investigation following a meeting at the White House with Japan's Prime Minister. Attorney General Merrick Garland tapping former U.S. Attorney and Trump appointee Robert Hur to oversee the probe. The documents were discovered just days before the midterm elections, with at least 10 of them at the Penn Biden Center, which is a Washington think tank. Administration officials could face grand juries or subpoenas from the special counsel, the FBI is reportedly interviewing the president's aides as part of this investigation. The White House says it is fully cooperating with the Justice Department, trying to draw a contrast with former President Trump, who resisted an FBI. But there is a political reality here that now the president and former president are both embroiled in special counsel investigations into the handling of classified documents. A subpoena to turn over those classified files was what Trump was trying to ignore. Now, according to some multiple media reports, one of the classified documents in Biden's case was found at his D.C. office and marked with the highest classification in the U.S. government. Matt. And we'll be keeping our eye on that one. Tara, thank you. Growing threats in the Far East are pushing Japan and the United States to bolster their relationship. Leaders from both countries meeting in Washington this week to focus on strengthening military ties. National Security Correspondent Caitlin Burke is following the story. Caitlin, what can we expect from this move? Matt, while the alliance between the U.S. and Japan remains strong, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin describes this plan as a modernization of the partnership, the ultimate goal being to, to counter threats from both North Korea and China. The U.S.-Japan alliance remains a cornerstone of our Indo-Pacific strategy, and it's critical to upholding a free and open regional order. President Biden met with Japan's prime minister today to discuss further security in the region, including how to transform Japan into a military power as threats grow in the Indo-Pacific. Let me crystal clear. The United States is fully, thoroughly, completely committed to the alliance, and more importantly, to Japan's defense. Last month, Japan released a new national security strategy, increasing its defense spending to a level in line with the standard set by NATO. The plan includes greater investments in missile technology to be used for offensive operations if needed. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin praised that move this week while announcing a new U.S. deployment arrangement in Japan. Today, we welcomed a, an historic alliance decision to optimize U.S. force posture in Japan by forward stationing 
more versatile, mobile, and resilient capabilities. These actions will bolster deterrence in the region and allow us to defend Japan and its people more effectively. The restructuring of U.S. troops would allow for more efficient movement to other islands along the coast if necessary. They'll also be equipped with advanced intelligence, surveillance, and long-range weapon capabilities that could reach enemy ships. We're replacing uh, an artillery regiment with an outfit that's, uh, that's more lethal, uh, more, uh, more agile, uh, more capable. Secretary of State Antony Blinken also announced a new space component between the two allies, noting that attacks to, from, or within space present a clear challenge. This agreement has been a... Some other issues discussed during the summit today between President Biden and Japan's Prime Minister include global supply chains, the war in Ukraine, and climate change. Matt? Caitlin, thank you very much. Well, here with us now is Meredith McGraw, national political correspondent at Politico. Meredith, thanks for joining us tonight on Faith Nation. Uh, a lot a lot going on, as we just saw from the past two stories, uh, that renewed emphasis on the U.S.-Japan relationship uh, may be overshadowed by the president's own controversy. We've been hearing about President Biden, and today he ignored some of those shouted questions from the press in the Oval Office about these uh, uh, classified documents. Do you think the White House has been caught uh, flat-footed here? Well, the White House is getting a lot of um, criticism for how they've handled this uh, documents uh, case so far. Um, there's been accusations that the White House hasn't been as transparent as they should be and that they should be more forthcoming about exactly how some of these um, documents, classified documents, ended up in um, President Biden's personal home and in his former uh, vice presidential um, office. Um, but, you know, this also comes at a time when the Biden administration feels like they should be um, starting the new year on the right foot. Um, all of those questions that Biden got uh, yesterday that really spun out of control came at an economic event when they were trying to tout um, inflation, some inflation numbers um, coming down. And this is also politically tricky for him as well as he is poised to announce another presidential run. Um, one of the the uh, talking points against uh, President Trump, his own handling of classified documents um, sort of comes comes into question as both the former president and now President Biden have had are having special counsel investigations into their behavior. Now, you just mentioned former President Trump. I guess you can't really talk about uh, the Biden situation without talking about that Trump situation. So so the question here is, is there some sort of level of hypocrisy on both sides of the aisle? Obviously, uh, critics will bring up the treatment of President Trump and what the FBI did at Mar-a-Lago. So are we seeing a level of hypocrisy now that uh, President Biden has his own document scandal going on? Look, there's no question that classified documents should be handled in a very sensitive way. Um, we're talking about information that could jeopardize American secrets. It could potentially jeopardize, you know, our, our military, people serving abroad, you know, really important things. And the current protocol is that all of those documents are turned over to the National Archives and their specific um, legal systems for declassifying that information. And the former president has had, and his allies have had uh, a bit of a political heyday with this because they are able to call for um, equivalent treatment here of, of um, President Biden. And I think there are key differences between both of these cases. Um, the former president, um, had a, a large uh, batch of, of classified documents that were found at his home. And it came after almost a year long back and forth with the archives over getting those documents back. And he's claimed that he was able to declassify them. And there's a legal debate around all of that. Um, whereas with, with President Biden, it does seem his lawyers found this and immediately went to the archives um, to, to turn it over. Um, but for both of them, they, it seems that they both didn't handle uh, the, these documents um, in, in the best way. But there's no doubt that for former President Trump, um, he's able to point to this instance and it really um, takes away 
uh, political talking point as well for Biden as we gear up for 2024. You know, Meredith, finally, I want to move on to, to something that could uh, play a major factor on Capitol Hill uh, very quickly. You had um, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen notifying Congress the U.S. is expected to hit the debt limit next week. Uh, how, how big of a deal is this and how big of a fight is this shaping up to be on Capitol Hill? So this is a, a big deal for many reasons. Um, simply one, if we default, it could send um, our markets into chaos. You know, we've been in some of these spending fights before, and this is setting up to be a big fiscal fight as we start the new session. And it's one that's going to cause some political headaches for Kevin McCarthy in particular, um, as he has said that any raising of the debt limit would have to be tied to spending cuts. And that's something that Republicans, lawmakers on the right um, have said that, that he must adhere to, whereas Democrats have mm. said um, it would be a red line if there were any sort of spending cuts to um, things like Social Security or um, social mm -hmm. spending programs um, that are frequently um, discussed as um, you know potential ways to, to trim the fat as they talk about um, raising the debt ceiling so that we do not default. Well, chaos on the Hill. I'm sure we'll be talking to you much more Nothing in the next uh, coming months. <laughs> Meredith McGraw, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is calling on President Biden to speak to a joint session of Congress, officially inviting him to deliver the State of the Union address on February 7th. In a letter sent to the president today, McCarthy writes, quote, the American people sent us to Washington to deliver a new direction for the country to find common ground, and to debate their priorities. Adding the president's remarks will inform lawmakers about efforts to address the priorities of Americans. Well, coming up, Israel drawing tougher lines against Palestinian terror groups, the impact it could have on the newly formed Jewish government when Faith Nation returns. In the Middle East, Israel is facing an increasing threat from Palestinian terror groups. Now, the new government, led by Benjamin Netanyahu, is promising a tougher line on terror. CBN News spoke with one expert tracking the rising threat to Israel's security. Chris Mitchell has that story. I'm standing on Mount Gerizim, known in the Bible as the Mountain of Blessing. The history of this area goes all the way back to the book of Genesis and the patriarch Abraham. But thousands of years later, this area is now home to many Palestinian terror groups. CBN News talk with Joe Trusman from the Foundation for Defense of Democracies overlooking the Palestinian city of Nablus, ancient Shechem, for a clearer picture of what allowed this growth in terror to happen. The status of the West Bank is, of, unfortunately, of conflict, uh, especially in the last year and a half. Militant organizations such as Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Hamas and Al-Aqsa martyr, martyrs brigades have established themselves in the northern West Bank and have been launching attacks against Israeli citizens, Israeli troops and uh, uh, Israeli settlements. Trusman explains how a weakened Palestinian Authority helped open the door for these groups to flourish. What's going on is that the Palestinian Authority has lost its influence over the years in areas such as the Northern West Bank. And what's happened is that these uh, Palestinian militant organizations have filled in the vacuum that's been left mm -hmm. by the PA. And what's happening is that they've been expanding, and by expanding, they've been able to launch these attacks against Israeli targets. Iran is also filling this vacuum with its own agenda. Their goal is to destabilize the West Bank. It's in their interest to do that. And they are undermining the, the Palestinian Authority. What they're also doing is supporting these groups, such as Palestinian Islamic Jihad, for example, or Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades. And what's happening, again, is we're seeing this huge increase in violence over the last year and a half. In order to show the world the true picture of what's happening in the West Bank, the Foundation for Defense of Democracies has created this interactive map on their website. We've taken media or we've taken data from local media. We've taken data from uh, IDF statements and um, claims by militant organizations. And we've put it together in this visual and which uh, describes and shows or illustrates rather mm -hmm. all the violence that's been happening since at least late March of this year. And it's very impressive as far as you can really see all of the shooting attacks and everything that's been happening in the past year and a half here. It's uh, it's unfortunately it's a uh, it's very sad to see, but uh, it's reality. In March of 2022, the IDF launched Operation Break the Wave to contain the violence and prevent further attacks. Last year, the IDF arrested about 2,500 Palestinian suspects and says it stopped 
500 potential terror attacks. Even with that effort, Truesman points to the Palestinian Authority as needing to fill the vacuum and suppress these terror organizations. It's a reality many people in the States and around the world need to know. Unfortunately, Israel's sitting on a volcano. And what I mean by that is all these attacks that have been happening over the year and a half has gotten to the point where I'm concerned that attack inside of Israel that's linked to the West Bank militant group is going to spur an Israeli military operation in areas uh, such as the Northern West Bank. People in and out of Israel will be watching to see how Israel's new government will respond to this growing threat. Chris Mitchell, Mount Gerizim, Samaria. Luring troubled teenagers through video games. That's the tactic some extremist groups are using to recruit new members. Brody Carter spoke with a former Nazi to hear firsthand how it happens and what can be done to protect against it. It's highly likely you or a family member have played video games. They've become so popular that an estimated 216 million Americans consider themselves gamers. That's more than half the country's population. And today's video games are a far cry from Pong and Pac-Man, for better and for worse. I'm currently actually looking at the darker sides of games and how games are being leveraged for radicalization and the mobilization of radical networks. We could post somebody to make a Nazi game on Roblox, let alone one of such expanse. Alex Newhouse and Dr. Rachel Coert are behind a groundbreaking study on the evolution of gaming and the platform's growing use to promote extreme ideologies and radicalization. I personally focus mostly on the far right and it appears that the far right is the most interested in using game platforms, but jihadists, Islamists, like they also engage with, with, um, with gaming platforms. They try to recruit teens and adolescents. It's a very small group of people, but it's a very powerful group of people. For those who believe they or their kids are safe from extreme propaganda, the Anti-Defamation League has found close to one in four people are exposed to white supremacist ideologies on the internet. That's about 54 million Americans. It was so shocking to me that the number was, it was 23%. I was like, it can't be 23%. Like, that is so high. How is that possible? So shocking, it became the catalyst for Cohort and Newhouse to dive into the research in order to raise awareness. One aspect behind this trend is the combining of video games with streaming platforms or social networking apps. Discord and Twitch, which aren't games, those are called you know, we refer to those as gaming adjacent platforms. And then things like Minecraft and Roblox, which have some sort of interactivity, those are games. Given this overlap, players can stream live gaming sessions or connect with complete strangers through chats and forums, which can be great, but also dangerous. Games were created as games first and social platforms second. But the problem is that the growth of games as kind of social networking spaces has exponentially outpaced the rate at which the gaming industry has kept up with their moderation. Discord, a social media platform for gamers, was specifically identified in 2020 as a hub and community for right-wing extremism. In Europe, the country's counterterrorism coordinator doubling down on that warning, saying extremists are increasingly present in digital gaming spaces. They shouldn't be leaving the game with strangers, just like you wouldn't leave the park with a stranger. If somebody's saying, hey, why don't you leave this gaming space and come join me and these other people you don't know on a third party server, that's usually a red flag, especially for younger children. Even so, Rachel points out the research finds there are game spaces that provide more good than bad. She adds there is a darkness, however, which is why she and her colleague are working to make games a safer place. I was a former extremist. I de-radicalized uh, almost 20 years ago. Um, I was part of a uh, organization called the Rolling Wood Skins, which was a offshoot of one of the largest national socialist or Nazi movements in the United States. Ryan Lowry shared with CBN about his former life as a prominent neo-Nazi with the goal of taking online hate groups mainstream. It's in every um, platform you go to. These recruiters, whether it's through jihadism or domestic terrorism, whatever it might be, they, they've adapted to and know where they need to be and how to find the most vulnerable people. In finding ways to finance his mission and move in the ranks, Lowry got into trouble with the law. While his life of crime ultimately led to prison, the time behind bars provided distance from his extremist group. Friends and family helped Lowry de-radicalize and ultimately rededicate his life to Jesus Christ. I was born and raised a Christian um, my whole life. 
I, I think that sometimes what happens is, is we can we can get tunnel visioned at times being Christians and not opening ourselves up to what other cultures are there and what other cultures do offer. I, I want it to be a shock to people. I want them to understand that um, you can be anybody. Nobody is untouchable from what these groups offer. For 10 years, Lowry has helped extremists find a new way to live through a counterterrorism effort called Parallel Networks. He says the only way to open those doors is through conversations and compassion. I looked at Jesus Christ and the way that he um, didn't go into churches to preach to the choir. He went out into areas where people were struggling, people that, you know, uh, adulterous like Mary Magdalene and others. I'm a firm believer that humanity um, we're supposed to treat each other with peace and kindness and love. And, and, and this lack of empathy that we have in our communities um, is what's ultimately, I believe, tearing us apart. Unfortunately, technology combined with bad actors has torn the social fabric by trying to replace community with an online world. That's why Dr. Cowart wants to remind gamers and others that when things appear bad online or in life, they have the power to make a change. When things seem a little bit off, the other great thing about games and the internet is you can just switch to a different server or switch to a different game or mute that person or block that person. Um, you don't have to engage in conversations that make you feel uncomfortable. Brody Carter, CBN News. Well, finally tonight, maybe you're skeptical about whether unidentified flying objects pose any real threat to the United States or are even real. But a new report shows that the U.S. government is taking them very seriously. The Pentagon released a long-awaited 2022 report on what they refer to as Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena, or UAP. The report covers about 350 new reports of UAP, mostly gathered from branches of the United States military. The Pentagon identified about half of the reports as, quote, balloon entities, a handful attributed to drones, birds, or airborne debris. That leaves nearly half of the reported sightings unexplained. The report concludes that UAPs represent a hazard to flight safety, and they'll continue taking any national security issues seriously. I guess the truth is out there. That's going to do it for us tonight. Have a great weekend, everybody.